Dr. Richard Ely. Rick. <laughs> I grew up in Ohio and um, was in public school and this was in the olden days before there was um, public law for educating folks with disabilities in public school and I lost my vision when I was about 12. And I can remember going back to my regular um, optometrist, ophthalmologist really. And he went out and got his partner and said, Rick has these little tiny marks on the center of his retina and I don't think I've ever seen him before and his partner didn't know what they were. And it turned out that in fact I was losing vision and had what was called macula degeneration. We, family got a horse. Kind of discovering myself through horses and realizing that you know, I could be capable of doing something that I could be successful at. That loss of vision happened kind of at the same time that the horses were happening. Mm -hmm. So although it felt like, oh, why is this happening to me? I, I'd been kind of a sickly kid and was just starting to kind of feel better and able to do more and then to find out that I was going to lose my vision. But the horses were there at the same time those kinds of experiences and being su successful showing horses, teaching other kids to ride, um, it just it made me feel okay about me. We ended up having more than one horse so we finally moved. And I moved across the street to the high school. The principal asked to meet with my parents and they said, or he said to them, well we're really uncomfortable having her here because, you know, he's blind and, you know, he could fall down the stairs or something. Well, what should happen? Well, he could go to the Ohio State School for the Blind, which was from where I lived two and a half hours away. And they decided, no, that wasn't going to happen. So for a number of years, um, they paid out of pocket to have me tutored. Because of the whole issue of being educated at home and not going to a school for the blind, and because there was no what's called public law 94-142, the education of all children, basically grew up having to either have people read to me or using recorded books. As a kid, really, my mom read to me a lot. She was a stay-at-home mom, but you know, she was well-educated and really thought reading was important. So she read to to me and to my sister, you know, all the time growing up as little kids. But I had that moment when um, we were all asked to find a passage that we wanted to read from a book that we really liked. And mine was Winnie the Pooh. And I went with my copy of Winnie the Pooh and I just stumbled and bumbled and, you know, really not, you know, it, books were kind of beyond me. And then when I was diagnosed as having a visual loss, and I thought, wow, they're really behind me. And I can remember my dad knew a contractor that he worked with who was losing his vision, and somebody had given him the old talking book machine. And he said to my dad, well, I'm not using it. Maybe your son would like to try it. And I can remember, <laughs> I just read everything that came to me, and it didn't matter what it was. At the school I'd been at, people kind of saw me as the wimpy kid, and certainly being visually impaired didn't help. And I, I started thinking about the fact that none of the kids who were in the school that I was going to knew me other than to be sort of a competent writer. And I thought, I don't have to be the wimpy kid anymore. When still at Culver, I taught film study as part of the English curriculum and found at Northfield Mount Hermon that it was a lot more developed. There were two people who were basically had their doctoral degrees in film study and I thought well I'm never going to get to teach that but at that time um, Northfield Mount Hermon offered kind of free summer study they would pay for degree programs so I started and I did a degree at Wesleyan down in Connecticut in film because of the film study I had become interested in the possibility of doing something like children's television because I you know had a background in education at that time, the only program like that sort of on the East Coast was at the Ed School, the grad Ed School at Harvard. 
So I applied and was accepted and pretty quickly discovered that where everything, although children's television courses were being offered, the program was still there. One of the first courses I took was on what was then being called interactive media. And Apple had come out with the Apple II computer and you know, it was going to be five years before every student in the country had an Apple II. And I realized pretty quickly in doing our lab assignments that unless somebody sat and read what was on the screen and read what I typed in when I typed in, I didn't have any access. And that kind of led me in a whole different direction and I became interested in technology access. I ended up looking at what happened to experienced blind writers when they had high quality speech access to what they had written. And that became my dissertation. I went to Boston College kind of doing the research that I was doing and other things. But also the, the contribution that the university made was that I could take courses and in that time I became a certified in Massachusetts teacher of uh, children with visual impairments. You know, nobody wants to be cut off from the world. I've been very fortunate in remaining pretty independent, and that doesn't mean that I don't I do everything by myself. The, the older people that I work with, people, people sort of my generation, or even just younger adults, that notion that you know you can do these things. I will be honest. For a long time, I did my best to hide my vision, the degree of my vision loss. It took a long time for me to be able to get out. It's okay to admit that you, you know, have a challenge in your life and that there are ways of dealing with that that makes life okay. And that, you know, the worst thing you can do is say that I'll never do that again because I can't. For years I went to Nova Scotia with my daughter and she has vision. And then she went off to college and then she went off and, you know, has a career. And so she doesn't have time to go to Nova Scotia. And for years I went, oh, well, I guess I'll never go to Nova Scotia again because how would I get there without her? And then I finally thought, that's crazy. Why am I doing that to me? I want to go to Nova Scotia. So last spring I got really brave and I made reservations in the cottage that she and I used to go to. And I found my way and I'm going back again this year. So. You know, it can happen that even at my age with all of the life that I've lived, I can play that game of I guess I'll never do this again. As long as I have what I have in my life, I want to make the most of it. I want to use that life and have fun and do things.